Hello and welcome to the interview. My guest tonight is Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, a Jamaican Canadian Islamic scholar who converted to Islam in the early 70s, but before that he got into communism, but consequently to Islam in the early 70s. And now he is not only a lecturer at the Islamic Online University, but he is the founder of the Islamic Online um, University. Dr. Phillips, welcome to the interview. My pleasure to be here. Uh, Jamaican Canadian, your environment must have been predominantly Christian in the beginning. And uh, what, what, what inspired you to move away from Christianity and let's say communism first? Well, of course, as you said, I was born in Jamaica to a Christian family. Both my parents were Christians. And I grew up in Toronto, <clears throat> Toronto, Canada, as a Christian, nominal Christian, to be honest. By name. Um, so uh, it wasn't until I went to university. Um, I went to university in Simon Fraser, majoring in biochemistry. And I got involved in the political movements of the time. In the, the, the late 60s, early 70s, there was a, an upheaval, you know, in uh, universities across Canada, across the U.S., you know, questioning Vietnam and, you know, the West's involvement in Vietnam, Canada's complicity in the uh, actions of the U.S. in the Vietnam. <clears throat> and um, I also became aware at that time of the, 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 the world situation in terms of you know, oppression and um, exploitation and all these other kinds of things. I read more about the history of black people in the West, what happened, slavery and things connected to it and became aware of what was happening in the South. So I became, you could say, politicized. You know, I became aware of, of, of a, a wrong situation in the world which needed to be corrected. So it wasn't enough for me to be just going and studying biochemistry. I, knew I needed to do something or be involved in some kind of movement which is about changing the world to a better place. So that's what you know, set me up for communism. Because the, 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 the movement at that period of time, you know, the communists were exploiting the movement and using it to, to uh, gain followers. So I was convinced by some of the professors who were teaching me at the university at the time that communism had the answer. You know, it brought about freedom, justice, equality, brotherhood, you know, all the beautiful things. And did things. you find that it did? To a certain degree, initially it seemed to, but then after I started to look at it on a world scale and what was happening um, in, in Russia, in China, you know, I, I could see things which were not pleasing. I mean, it seemed to be very harsh, very rough. Stalin, you know, massacred millions uh, to, to just eradicate the, the bourgeoisie, the former capitalists, you know. Uh, Mao Zedong in the Cultural Revolution, millions more lose their lives because they're unable to, to accept the, the, the new ideology. You know, it seemed, a bit, and then not only that, these countries, as communist countries, couldn't compete with the West. You know, after all this talk about capitalism and communism and, and, and economics of capitalism and communism, uh, the, the communists couldn't compete economically with the West. There was something missing which led to their eventual downfall and they had to start to introduce capitalist economics back into their countries to, in order to move ahead. You know? So they, obviously it wasn't the answer. There was something missing. And that's what made me open to hearing the message of Islam at that point when I came to that realization that communism wasn't the answer. And I knew capitalism definitely wasn't. It had good points, but it had a lot of bad points. You know? and, and Christianity really didn't deal with uh, you know, anything beyond the church. It was leave unto God what is God's and unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So it left that whole world of politics and abuse. economics. Yeah, you know. So I needed something which encompassed everything. And uh, alhamdulillah. And how did, you, how did you discover it? How did you discover Islam? Well, the actual instant which opened it up was uh, one uh, sister who was in the communist uh, organization which I was in in Toronto. She converted to Islam. Some uh, brothers had come up from the U.S. 
uh, who were former members of the you know, Black Panthers and, and the, the political movement in the U.S. and had converted to Islam themselves. And they were trying to reach out to members of this organization I belong to. And um, she accepted the message. And that caused me to say, well, oof, what is this? You know, uh, let me have a look at this. You know, why? I wanted to know why. Why, why convert to, to a religion when we were taught that religion was the opiate or the opium of the masses you know it just was used to 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 drug people into submission so that the capitalists could exploit them <laughs> you know that's how it was mm -hmm. sort of taught in communist uh, theory and and um, thought so she explained well no no this is not a religion like the religions we know it's not like christianity you know islam is a whole different story altogether so i said okay let me read you know and i got some books i started reading studying you know coming to understand and you know as i the more i read the more i became convinced that yes islam was really what i was looking for then you sought knowledge you traveled to saudi arabia you went to the middle east then you started to uh, extend your knowledge where did you study well the reason why i went there in the first place was because i wanted to learn islam from the sources i accepted islam in toronto but, you know, those around me who were teaching me Islam uh, were confused. Uh, one, some were saying something, you know, Hanafi. Another one said Maliki. Another one said Shafi. And, you know, it, people had different ideas and it wasn't really clear. So I said, I needed to go to the sources. I need to learn Arabic and I need to take it from where it came, you know, back to Medina. So I went to Medina and studied in the university there. I did my BA in Arabic and Islamic studies from the Islamic University of Medina. Then I went on and did a master's in Islamic studies from King Saud University uh, College of Education, specializing in, in Islamic theology. And then added to that a PhD from University of Wales in the UK, also in uh, Islamic theology. So that was a quest for knowing Islam as you know, as detailed a way as I could. So I, I did, it wasn't, it, I, I was not, it was not sufficient for me to just say, okay, I became a Muslim and I'm now a Muslim. Oh yeah, I'll pray five times a day, I'll do this. No, I needed to know, you know, everything I could about it, to understand it, to be able to explain it to others. Because of course, my parents, my family, they want to know, well, why? You know, and if I couldn't give them some logical, reasonable explanation, I felt myself, you know, deficient because they, they deserve the logical and reasonable explanation. From a spiritual point of view, how close have you been uh, in your religion, in, in your communication, in your communion with God? How close do you think you've got? Well, I feel the presence of God in my life, you know, as a reality now. You know, before, um, yeah, growing up as a Christian, it was distant. It was it was far away you know it was represented by a man you know and a man and god you know that's like blocking you from the real god because if if jesus is the god then um you know it means he as a man is everywhere and you know he's he sees everything and and it just didn't make sense in us you know in that from that perspective that man is man we have a limitation we are born we die we don't have the ultimate uh, characteristics and qualities which raise us above the creation. We are part of creation. You know, we're animals, just another level. We're a bit higher. That's all, really. That, I mean, although we tend to look at ourselves as, you know, being supreme beings, <laughs> you know, in that sense in this world, but the reality is that we're only a step up above the animals. So whether you worship a man or you worship a cow or anything else, you're still worshiping God's creation. So, you know, how to get close to God when you don't know who God is? So you discovered God in your submission, in your communion during prayer time. Yeah, it was really for me, I mean, I had to discover God uh, to go beyond the intellectual acceptance of Islam because I could accept Islam intellectually that it did have the good points of all of the various systems. It was free from the bad points 
of those systems. But still, that was just that was an intellectual exercise. For me to accept God in my heart, to accept God in my soul, in that sense, it required another step, you know, a step where I could feel God in my life, you know, and I had my own, you know, personal uh, experience, which, which led me to conclude, you know, to, to remove any doubt about the existence of God. Because, of course, as a communist for how many years, four or five years, I was denying God's existence altogether. There was no God. So for you to go from that to belief in God means that you have to make a leap of faith, as they say, or you have to make a step which now carried you into the spiritual realm. You have got knowledge, and from there you put uh, pen to paper. You've written some, some books on Islam. Could we uh, take a look at some of the things you've written? Well, the books I wrote initially were books to clarify uh, confusion which existed in, amongst new Muslims in the West. My initial writings were about Shiaism, to clarify that this is not real Islam because it was being promoted in the 80s through Khomeini. It was promoted as Islam, but in fact, it wasn't. So I needed to clarify that because I had access to information which people in the West didn't have. So my initial writings were in that area. I also wrote about polygamy. Uh, one of my early books was Polygamy in Islam. Because this was something uh, which uh, was new to people in the West, you know, and uh, the, the society considered it to be something forbidden. This is ca called bigamy, you know, a crime. <laughs> Here is Islam is saying it's a way of life, you know, it's legitimate. So to understand it, to explain it, to explain the rules governing it, no, it's not a free for all, you know, there are rules governing it. So I wrote on that. Then I wrote on Tawheed, on the unique oneness of God, you know, the basic Islamic theological cons concept of God. So that was like a, you could say, my magnus opus, you know, of, of my writings, right? The, the book called The Fundamentals of Tawheed. Then I wrote on um, Islamic studies in general, because I became, when I finished my PhD, my, my BA and I started on my master's, I became a teacher in high school and junior high. I was asked to teach Islamic studies, but there were no books in, available in English on Islamic studies. So I had to create textbooks for the children. So that process produced a series of textbooks called Islamic Studies, uh, four books for junior high and high school, which I produced. These teachings you did in Canada? They, no, they were being used in English medium schools mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia and around the world. They were used in Canada, U.S., U.K., Australia. They are they're being used all over the world today. Mm -hmm. um, then I started because I, 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 when I moved to, from the South, Saudi Arabia to the UAE, I became a professor in the American University in Dubai. And I taught there for 10 years, so uh, Islamic studies and Arabic. So I now had to create books which explained... Uh, Arabic from an English perspective, so I wrote two books on that. Then I also had to explain, you know, the various disciplines of Islamic studies. So I started to create textbooks for fiqh, for hadith, for tafsir, for, you know, the other basic disciplines of uh, Islamic studies. And uh, then I set up a department of Islamic studies and worked further in terms of creating more and more books. Uh, dealing with um, current thought, one of my books is called The Clash of Civilizations, an Islamic Point of View, because that book came out of by Huntington, Samuel P. Huntington's book. So it needed an Islamic view on all of this. So I, I, I did a, a writing on that. And so on and so forth. My books actually tended to be more academic, you know, basically to prepare for uh, setting up my uh, a university myself, which I set up in, in India uh, back in 2009. Uh, I went to Chennai in South India and I set up a university there called Preston International College. And from there I went online 
to develop the Islamic Online University. And of course, these textbooks form the backbone of uh, the courses, most of the courses there. We use other texts also, but it's the, it's the core backbone for the, the textbooks for the university. Uh, Dr. Bilal, let me take you now to uh, the core of our discussion on the interview, the Islamic Online University. How did it come about? Well, um, in 2007, actually, um, a number of people were writing me on the uh, internet, emailing me and asking me about some different websites which they wanted to go and study at. So when I looked at the websites, they asked my opinion. I went and looked at the websites. I found that they were deviant. That's yeah, one I, I always go to, islamicity.com, islamiccity.com. That's a general website. That's, general that's okay. That's okay. not really, uh, you know, a, 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 a study website per se. Meaning that mm. it's it's a it's a college of some sort online. But there were there are some already up there, and people had gone and there were you know one called Sunni Path and a few others like this, which were in fact really they had deviant ideas with mm. them. Mm. So I felt that there needed to be an alternative for people. So mm. that was like around 2007, I decided to go ahead and um, start a university course, uh, really a diploma, uh, which was to be offered freely, you know, in order to compete with these others who had already been functioning for two, three, four years ahead of me, you know, in order to draw and attract people, I offered it. And of course, in any case, I wanted it to be accessible to everybody. I offered it freely. And people responded in droves. They started coming, signing up. You know, within the first year, we had some 2,000 plus students. Second year, 4,000 plus. Third year, we're you know going to 8,000. Now there are over 100,000 students studying uh, the diploma course across the world from every single country on the face of the earth. We now have students. How does this online university work? Well, the diploma course. Um, and, and we started, I should mention, in 2010, I started a BA, you know, using those textbooks that I had been preparing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been teaching uh, also on the ground out a BA in Islamic studies from English perspective. I had started a department I mentioned earlier. So all of that was now recorded and then offered online. So how it operates is that a person registers um, for the diploma, you don't need any kind of qualifications. You don't, even if you didn't do your high school, whatever, you can join. You just register, classes are open for you, and you start. Okay? For the BA, you have to have a, uh, a, a high school certificate because BA now means an academic uh, degree. Uh, you have to maintain uh, university standard international university standards so we require students to have you know an accredited a high school degree for them to enter once they have entered in then they are given um, a series of courses which are, are they have to, they, they may choose from or they have to do uh, for the BA the each course has basically 30 hours of recorded lectures mm -hmm right by a phd or masters in that field along with that they have 15 live lectures by a ba tutorial assistant who would then explain questions uh, that students may have regarding the recorded lectures they do tests after every lecture they do a midterm uh, halfway through the semester and a final uh, these are multiple choice uh, tests so it can all be done online. We don't have to have a, a physical location. But for the final exam of the semester, the, it, this has to be done from an examination center. So we uh, have, for example, here in Gambia, you know, Imam Malik Institute is one of our examination centers. We have Microtech is another examination center. The University of the Gambia has also agreed to be an examination center for us. So the students will go there still doing their exam online but with an invigilator to confirm their identity not to prevent them from cheating because the way it is set up it's not possible to cheat because everybody gets a different exam 
you know the 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 programming system that's available today can give it's every individual. student everyone has his own exam very well you very know well, you have well. 50 students in a class everyone has a different exam so nobody can benefit from looking at anybody else's computer etc so you're on your own you know but the point is that uh, you could get somebody else to go write your exam for you so that in, in vigilation where they check your id to confirm you who are writing the exam is the same person who registered for this course right so you know that is the overall uh way in which it fun functions uh now in, in this final exam with the use of uh plays and uh, personnel like the invigilators would there be is there any cost to that well for the ba there is a cost as we said for the for the diploma it's free mm. no cost we have volunteers 25 plus volunteers who are working to keep it running but for the ba because we had to now hire full-time lecturers we had to hire full-time tutorial assistants invigilators and things like this now there is a cost but we have put it on a sliding scale unesco's scale of uh gnp of the various countries the the underdeveloped countries uh, are only forty dollars the developed countries are hundred and twenty dollars per semester this is just for a semester not tuition uh, the tuition remains free so it's only a semester registration fee of forty dollars for students here in the gambia and they would pay at the uh, islamic bank of the gambia ajib or agib you're watching the interview. My guest is Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Um, he is the founder of the Islamic Online University. Um, I'll come back to the online university and your work you're doing. But let us look at Islam in the international arena. First of all, I want to draw your attention to what is meant by being a Sunni and a Shiite. What is the difference between these two sects? Well, to put it simply, you know, people maybe look at it as a political difference because the issue of whether Abu Bakr should have been the Khalifa, Khalifa. after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or should it have been Ali, this is a minor point. This is not really the issue. The big issue is the issue of intermediacy. The difference between Protestantism and Catholicism in the sense that Catholicism accepts intermediaries uh, who are called saints, who people can pray to, besides God. Whereas Protestantism has rejected all of that. They say, no, you only pray to God. Similarly, in Islam, it is even more precise. You only pray to God who is not a man. You know, this is the basic teachings of Sunni Islam, that we only worship God alone. Whereas the various deviant groups, whether they be Shiites or others, they now have put intermediaries between themselves and God. And they say, they argue that, you know, we as human beings cannot go directly to God because we're dirty with sins. God is pure. We need somebody who will intermediate for us, who will be between us and God, who will carry our prayers to God. But God in the Quran clearly says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call on me and I will answer you. He didn't say call on my close friend or, you know, whatever, and, and he will get it to me and I'll answer you. No, he said, call on me and I will answer you. So this is the fundamental difference. For Shiites, they pray to the Imams, the 12 Imams. They pray to them. They believe that they are intermediaries between themselves and God. So they will call on them and ask them to do things for them. And this is not from Islam. And this is, this is where they have deviated. Could that be related to uh, the day of resurrection when all prophets will try to intercede between mankind and Allah and subsequently, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, will be the only one that will intercede between Allah and mankind for mankind to be forgiven his sins. Well, the concept of the intercession on the Day of Judgment, it includes not only Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, as, but as well all of the prophets. Absolutely. All of them will have an, an element of intercession that God will have them honored by interceding on behalf of, on behalf of humankind mm. for those who God had already decided would be going to paradise. Because know that if God has decided that somebody is going to hell, 
based on the evil of their lives, etc., and he's all merciful already, then no one can actually change that decision on the part of God's. But those people who God had decided to forgive because they had done so much other good or whatever, you know, then these people are forgiven on that day when it seemed like they would be going to hell the prophet muhammad may god's peace and blessed be upon him and the other prophets will intercede on their behalf and it will, it will be a way by which god honors those prophets or honors special individuals you know who he has chosen uh, to show give them that status on that day you know so it is the intercession is still in accordance with the will of god Dr. Phillips, I'll ask you a very uh, crucial question. What is evil? Evil is fundamentally disobedience to God. That is the fundamental uh, element of it. It is evil to deny God's existence. This is a part of disobedience. It is evil to steal because God forbade us from stealing. It is evil to destroy plants and, 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 and pollute the, the atmosphere and the land because this is a gift from God and God forbade us from doing these things. So evil really is the rejection or the disobedience to God. It has, of course, different levels, just as goodness or righteousness has different levels. Would there be any, any sin greater than the sin of Adam? by disobeying God from God's own physical presence. Shall I say presence? Because God did speak to Adam and forbid Adam from, not, from eating the, 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 uh, uh, the tree of life. But having heard God himself speak to Adam and Adam disobey willfully, willingly as well, um, does is there any other scene that supersedes that? Of course, the taking of one's life. No, I mean even greater than that is the sin of disbelieving sin. in God. That is the greatest sin. That is the one unforgivable sin, the, to disbelieve in God or to worship others besides God. In the case of Adam's dis, uh, disobedience, really that that shows the mercy of God. In that, Adam, having disobeyed God, turned back to God in repentance and God forgave him. You know, Satan also disobeyed God. So in the end, really, in terms of sin, they both disobeyed God. So why is Satan cursed and Adam forgiven? Because Satan, when he was shown that he had disobeyed God, he realized that he had, in fact, uh, committed a sin instead of turning back to God in repentance as he had been taught because God is not going to put a person in that situation or a, hu uh, a creature in that situation without giving it a way out so he had the ability to turn back to God in repentance but instead he chose arrogance he questioned why should I bow to Adam Adam is inferior to me this is the basis of racism this is the basis of of pride you know, and this is the, this is the evil that that quality of pride which leads one to to disobey God. This is what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said: No one will enter paradise who has a mustard seed's worth of pride in his heart, because this is an ultimate evil element. You know, when one accepts this and it becomes a way of life and it controls one, then we have gone completely okay. off. The path. Mm -hmm. so, so the point here, very important point, when we said, one, that Adam willingly disobeyed God. He was deluded. He was tricked by Satan. Satan called the tree the tree of eternal life. God didn't call it that. It is not the tree of eternal life. Then man, it was man just would, a tree. Man, man wouldn't have died <laughs> yeah. if it was no, the no, tree of eternal life. No, 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 life. no. no. We'd, no yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't the tree of eternal life. Yeah. As you said, if he ate it, he wouldn't have died. So it was just a trick. Satan, in order to get him to eat from the tree, he gave it that name. It didn't have a name. God just told him, don't eat from this tree. There are all the other trees you can eat from, but not from this one. And that is the nature of halal and haram. For every 
haram element, there are a thousand halal equivalent to it. Pork is forbidden. But goats and sheep and cows and so many other things are permissible. You know, alcohol is forbidden. But so many other drinks are permissible. Way more than the drinks which are alcoholic. So, but what happens is that Satan comes and makes the forbidden so attractive you feel you have to have some. You know? So alcohol is presented in such a nice and attractive way, you know, that you feel so good and you're this and you're that. So you feel, oh, I got to have some of that. You know, my life is incomplete unless I have some. You know, similarly with pork and, and, and similar with other sins like adultery or fornication. I mean, these are forbidden things. But it's glorified in the media and, you know, it becomes girlfriends and, you know, this is living the life and all this kind of thing. So Satan beautifies it and makes it so attractive. You know, same thing with nakedness. You know, to walk around naked, this is something objectionable. This is the way of the animals. It's okay for animals, but for human beings, you know, who have this consciousness to be walking around naked is unacceptable. You know, the nudist colonies in, in Europe and nudist beaches and all this are very offensive for Muslims too. But then, for Muslim women today, now to wear clothes, as the Prophet Muhammad had said, a time would come when women would be clothed but unclothed. They would be wearing clothes, but they are virtually naked. So this is what we find walking in the streets now today. And it's coming from the Western thought. Women who wear clothing as if somebody sprayed a paint on their body only. You know, they're completely naked, but they think they're covered. Maybe they might even wear a scarf on their head. You know, but this is uh, Satan has deluded them into thinking, I'm covered. But no, you're not. We can see everything. You know, you're not covered. Dr. Phillips, let me take you to the Arab Spring. This is an international phenomenon. Why are the Arab states crumbling? Well, I don't think it is crumbling. It is an awakening. It is a part of the Islamic awakening taking place all over the world. You know, why did the, the, the police and military state of Indonesia fall? You know, it was the Indonesian Spring. They never call it that, but that's what happened there. Those military rulers that had controlled Sukarno, Suharto, had controlled the country for, so, for half a century were up, overturned. And who did they replace them by? Abdul Wahid, half-blind Muslim uh, cleric, was brought as president of the country. The first president to replace these military people. This is because the people want Islam. So this desire to want Islam... Uh, expressed in all aspects of society is a natural desire of Muslims. So this Arab, what we call Arab Spring, is the is the final revolt of the people, the revolt from oppression fundamentally that they were repressed, they were oppressed people. So, but at the same time, there was the Islamic element which which was there to help to guide it towards an Islamic conclusion, because a simple economic revolt will only replace one ruler with another one. You know, Abdul Nasir, Jabal Abdul Nasir, he took over from King Farouk. King Farouk had been running the country, you know, as his own personal thing. He was the king, benefiting, etc. People were oppressed. So when they replaced him with Jamal Abdul Nasir, he also oppressed the people. You know, because it was only an economic revolt. It was not an Islamic revolution not a change on the basis of Islam. So, so what we're seeing there is, a, is a, an economic revolt in its origins, but an Islamic awakening in its development. Doctor, don't you think the word jihad is being um, used in a very loose way, as we now find in countries now it's coming to uh, uh, south of the sahara in nigeria in places like in mali algeria and not to mention what takes place um in some countries in the west where muslims will say they're fighting against the 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 the, uh, the disbelievers the, the disbelievers mm -hmm. now what is your what is your view of the modern day jihadist that will blow up himself and kill people. Is that the 
the essence of a jihad? Well, fundamentally, we know that jihad is the struggle against evil, which begins with oneself. And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had even said that the greatest jihad is the jihad against one's own evil desires. So this is the, this is the essence of the jihad. It's a struggle against evil. Now, as it manifests itself in different levels of the society, there are guidelines which Islam has placed for it. Among those guidelines, for example, you know, uh, when you're dealing with jihad against yourself, is that you can't forbid yourself to ever marry or forbid yourself to sleep at night or forbid yourself to eat or just fast every day. No, these are forbidden. Though this is a kind of a jihad that you, you may want to struggle against your desires for food, etc., but you're going to go and starve yourself. No, the Prophet said, don't do this. It's extreme. So extremes in everything Islam is opposed to. Allah said, we have created you ummatan wasata, a balanced middle nation. That's, his, that's the message of Islam. We don't go to extremes to one side or to the other side. Now what we see going on today in the, in these, in the name of jihad are extremes. Extremes which go against the very teachings of Islam. Islam forbids us to kill innocent for civilians. So all of this blowing up and, you know, in, in, in uh, supermarkets and in airports and in middles of cities, all of this is forbidden in Islam. Islam has no place for it at all. You know? And similarly, even just to take up arms simply to, to resolve problems in the society, this is again evil. You know? the, the Prophet Muhammad you know, forbade the taking up of arms against the society. You know, we should resolve our issues through political means. We should do it through education. This is why the main motto of the Islam Islamic Online University is changing the nation through education. This is the way to go, for people to understand what is correct. And when they understand what is correct, the leadership will rise from among them who will make the corrections. Dr. Phillips, you've been to the Gambia, and I'm sure you must have realized the uh, sort of uh, religious tolerance that happily exists in this country. Uh, Christians and Muslims living side by side. We have a church in Banjo and just adjacent to that church is a mosque. Uh, don't you find this unique? Well, I wouldn't say it is unique. It is, it is a part of Islamic history. You know, Muslims ruled Spain for 700 years and the churches remained. They existed. Mosques were built and they existed side by side with the churches that were there. When Omar ibn al-Khattab came into Jerusalem, and they wanted him to pray you know, where, the, where one of the major churches was. He refused to do so that people may build you know, an Islamic structure later on and destroy the, that Christian structure. So Muslims controlled Jerusalem where Jews, Christians and Muslims lived side by side and continued. That is how it has been and that is the norm in Muslim society. Good. So what uh, we can say here in Gambia is that it is, alhamdulillah, this aspect of religious tolerance, which is a part of Islamic teachings, is implemented here in Gambia. Doctor, let me take you back to where you just uh, touched on is um, Jerusalem, Bait al some call it, I mean. How significant is Jerusalem to the three major religions, Christianity, Judaism and Islam? Well, for uh, Jews, this is where the Temple of Solomon was built. And they believe that it has to be rebuilt. For Christians, this was where Jesus was born. And they believe that for Jesus to come back into this world, the Temple of Solomon has to be rebuilt. For Muslims, we believe that this was the place in which Prophet Suleiman did build the temple, which we know as uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, that's what we call it today. And that this is sufficient for the rebuilding or the establishment of the Temple of Solomon, because it was a mosque. So it is the third of the three holiest mosques in Islam. Doctor, let me take it to 
the unbelievers. Let's look at, for example, a place like the Soviet Union, where probably culturally um, people have not been aware of Islam. And you grew up in a family that has no idea about religion now, and you believe in nothing. When you die, will you be judged as, a, un, as an unbeliever? Well, it depends on the course of your life. You see, when you're looking at the hypothetical situation that you have described, what we can say is that uh, if that person never heard the message of Islam, or the only way that it came to them was in a distorted fashion, yes, they have died as an unbeliever, but God will not judge them for their disbelief since they did not have an opportunity to achieve belief. Similarly, children who die, uh, similarly people who are retarded, you know, or, or don't have the means to understand the message, you know, etc. All of these people, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, explain that all of these people who never got the message properly, they will be brought back, they will be resurrected together, separate from the people who had the message, made the choice of heaven and hell, and they are being resurrected for judgment. These will be resurrected separately, resurrected with their full faculties, and there will appear before them at the time of resurrection a wall of fire, right? And when they're all resurrected before this wall, a messenger will come out of the fire to them and will talk to them. It will tell them about God and, and belief in God and, and all of the various necessary knowledge that they needed to have to be able to make a choice. When this is told to them, then they will be instructed to enter into that same fire from which he came. People will walk towards it, the fire will flare up, some will back off and others will walk through. They will try a few more times, more will go through, and then there only remains those who refuse. They say, no, we're not going in. So at that point, the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, said, those who went through will go on to paradise. There are those who, if the message came to them, they would have believed it. Those who refuse to step in, they're the ones going to hell. Because they're the ones who, if the message had come to them, they would have rejected it. Doctor, uh, finally, um, what are your plans um, I know you do this online university, but do you have any plans to work with the University of the Gambia? Well, inshallah, we have very great plans. We hope uh, which will work out you know, with a form of affiliation with the university, um, offering our programs from the university. This is all in discussion at the moment. We hope it will uh, end up in that, in that state. But either way, we are offering through the Islamic University online an opportunity for the madrasa graduates, some 30,000 of them coming out of your schools here in the Gambia every year. Only 50 of them and less get accepted into Arab universities. Only 100 of them and less become teachers in the next year. The vast majority, 29,850 of them, have no place to go, no future. So the Islamic Online University is going to provide for them a means to upgrade their English and to further their studies in Islamic studies. And our program, as you have seen, it goes beyond the standard Sharia subjects. We also teach psychology. We teach also you know, counseling. We teach Islamic economics. We teach uh, you know, management. We teach education. So all of this is included in the course of our study to prepare the graduates to be most uh, functional in the society after graduation. Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, thank you very much for joining me on the interview. Alhamdulillah, my pleasure to be here. That was Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, uh, Jamaican, Canadian. He is uh, an Islamic scholar, erudite Islamic scholar, and now runs the uh, Islamic Online University. Join me, Malik Jones, next week for another edition of the interview.